make something to store my evens. I'm going to go through each number in the array. If it's even, uh, I'm going to use the dot even method because I discovered that. It's like, oh, that's really cool. I don't have to do modulo 2. Um, and then I'm going to add it to my list and return it. And this is going to return 2468, but it's much better. And hopefully I had a test that showed me that uh, my code is still correct. Um, but even this, you know, it's like, well, I'm kind of setting up an array in the beginning, and then I, you know, I'm kind of managing the array throughout, and I have to remember to return it at the end, and some of those sorts of things. So what if there are a way for me to just say, give me all the even numbers. That's what I want to do. You know, I'm not a programmer because I love, you know, writing these bits of logic to find even numbers, right? I'm like, I'm trying to find even numbers because I want to do something more important. So what if instead I just said, go through the array and select all of the even numbers. Um, you know, it's almost a direct translation of what I'm actually trying to do into code. Um, and so, you know, uh, the original sort of inspiration for this talk was, you know, there was a little bit of code like this, a lot of code like this, but a little more complex inside. And I said, why don't you just write that, you know? Wouldn't it be better if you just wrote one line? Um, so, you know, uh, most of those methods, or the select method is one of the many examples that's in the enumerable module of Ruby. Um, so again, why enumerable? Um, once you kind of get the hang of it, typically it's more expressive. So select, when I see that word, it's telling me something about what the code is doing. And it's telling me a lot more than each is, right? Each is just telling me I'm iterating over something, whereas select is telling me I'm filtering a list. So as soon as I see the word select, I know, okay, I'm applying a filter. And then I can focus in on what, what I'm filtering. Um, in a lot of cases, again, I'm describing what, not how, right? So when I had the iterated, like when I had my index and I had my counters and I had all that other stuff, that's telling me how I iterate through an array and get what I need. What I really want to describe is what I want, right? I want even numbers out of it. Um, the other piece of it is limiting side effects. So I mentioned, uh, you know, I forgot to increment my counter, right? That's sort of a side effect of the loop that I'm running through. Um, it's not actually sort of relevant to the problem that I'm solving. Um, a lot of bugs in code come from, you know, unexpected data manipulations and things like that. So any any place where you can sort of restrict what's changing underneath you, it's typically a win. So uh, for the most part, we're going to work with arrays and hashes. Those are kind of the two most common things that use the enumerable module. Um, you can also define your own pretty easily. Um, I.O., like, so file access is another thing where you use enumerable. Um, I'm not really going to work on that just because I, you know, it's a presentation and I don't have a file on the internet that's easily accessible in Ruby. So uh, we'll mostly work with arrays and hashes, but I'll touch really quickly on. Um, so for example, let's say I have a team, and I want to be able to call team.each because a team is actually a collection of people, and that's fairly <coughs> common. Um, so if you want to define your own class, or if you want to make one of your classes enumerable, you can just include that enumerable module. And then you have to define each method that tells you how to iterate over it. And once you've done those two things, you get access to you know, 30 or 40 different methods that'll help you write better code. So there's each, and there's sort by, and there's max, and there's select, and there's um, you know, some other ones that we'll talk about here in a second. So um, just by defining, just by doing include enumerable and defining each method, you get a whole bunch of magic super amazing, and it will change your life for the better. And then eventually you'll get annoyed that Ruby doesn't have first class functions, and then you'll be a, a Haskell Mac here. And, but <laughs> we'll save that for later. <laughs> no, the original one was going in that direction. <laughs> That's why now it's not enumerable and not function. Um, so you now have access to every method in enumerable. So I'll kind of pull it up really quickly somewhere. OK. So all of these methods, uh, backwards scroll are on Ruby's enumerable. And we're going to talk through some of the more interesting or better ones. Um, but you know, there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do here. So just by writing those three or four lines there. So kind of running through, um, start with the basics, and we'll kind of fly through those. Um, if anybody has questions, or you want me to slow down a little bit, I can. But we'll try and go through those quickly. So, Again, kind of the core operator here is each. So um, each is basically, when you see the word each, what you're saying is I'm going to iterate over a loop, and typically I'm going to have some kind of side effect. Um, usually it's something simple, like I'm going to print to the console, or 
um, you know, in Rails, a lot of the time you're displaying, you're writing HTML to a buffer, right? You're saying, I want to put uh, list items into this list, or I want to, you know, add a div or something. Those are technically side effects, even if you don't really think of them that way. Um, so, you know, simplest thing that you can do is just, let's say we'll go through the numbers from 1 to 10 and print i. And if you look at a console and you put that in IRB, it'll print 1 through 10. Um, so uh, one kind of interesting thing about each is it actually returns whatever array you call it on at the end. So if you call 1 to 10 dot each, it'll print 1 through 10 in the console. But print or puts actually returns null as its output because it's a side effecting function. Um, and so in the end, you'll actually see an array with 1 to 10 in your IRB. Um, usually, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can kind of use that to chain other functions on top of each if you want to kind of print out some debugging information. Um, but one trick you might see sometimes, or you might need if you're debugging, is putting a you know, semicolon and a nail after it. Um, because uh, if you have you know, 10,000 elements in an array and you're iterating over each of them, you know, and then you're printing something out, uh, by the time it finishes, you're going to have those 10,000 elements in your IRB terminal again. So, um, so there's a few other kind of twists on that. So there's an each with index, which is useful if you kind of say, oh, I only want to do the even elements or something. Uh, it's pretty easy to get at that. So print ant and cat because the arrays are zero index to read. So zero and two, ant and cat. Um, one other kind of little twist is that each actually returns an enumerator. Um, if you don't call it the block. So um, I call the iterator here, but it's technically the enumerator class in Ruby. Um, and you can call dot next, and it'll kind of one at a time give you the next element out of that array. So I call that first, it gave me one. If I call it again, it'll give me two. Um, and it calls it up to the point where it gives you a stop iteration exception, which uh, is normal. like the each method with a block actually captures that exception, so you never see it. But that's how it actually knows that it's done iterating is internally it's using an enumerator class and then returning a stop iteration. Um, so the kind of interesting bit there is there's a method on enumerators called with index. So even uh, methods like map, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, there's no map with index kind of built into Ruby, but you can just call dot map, get the enumerator back, and then call dot with index on that. Uh, and that allows you to do a map with an index and things like that. So that was a trick that I actually didn't know, um, you know, when I first started doing Ruby for quite a while, and it turned out to be pretty sweet. So, um, so yeah, a little trick there. So there's a bunch of these sort of Boolean methods. They're pretty simple. They're going to do exactly what you think they're going to do for the most part. Uh, so there's a method called all. And that's going to return true if everything passes the condition. So 2, 4, 6, and 8, are those all even? Uh, yes, they are. Um, 2, 4, 6, and 8, are any of those odd? No, they're not. Uh, so 1 is interesting. It only returns true if exactly one element uh, passes the condition. So in that case, 9 is the only odd number that returns true. Uh, none is, you know, in a lot of languages, you might have to write not any or something like that to get the same value as none. Ruby makes none a first class operator. Um, but one thing that's nice for the few of you that are kind of new to Ruby is, um, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on here. You don't have all that ceremony that I was talking about. You might have a language in another language where you have to set up your iterators and things just to figure out whether or not anything is on or even. Um, so it reads a little bit like English. Um, so there's one called include. Pretty simple. It just tells you whether or not an array or a hash contains the given element. Um, and then there's a Rails only edition that's an active support called many. Um, sounds really dumb, but uh, it returns true if more than one of the things is true. Um, so in this case, more than one of them is even. Sometimes it comes in handy when you're kind of trying to decide how you want to lay out a page or something. Like there's only one element that, um, you know, if, like, if there's only one element in a particular section, you may want to do something different than if there's more than one. Um, so there's also no block versions of all of these. Um, so uh, these basically return true if all of the elements in the array are truthy. Um, so Ruby's definition of truthy is anything that's not false or nil. Other languages sometimes treat zero as a falsy value, um, but in Ruby that's not true. So two false, six, and eight, which I don't know why you would ever have that in an array, but uh, more power to you. 
Um, those are not all truthy um, because false is false. So um, two, four, six, and eight, or two false, six, and eight. God, I should have made that a different number than four. Um, are any of those truthy? Yes. Uh, one, none, and many all have the same kind of behavior. So um, those are, again, kind of useful in the Rails context sometimes. Um, you, know, you might want to just say users.empty, or you know, you, sometimes though it's a little better to say users.many, or something like that if you have more than one of them. Um, so I'm, I got tired of typing out a little long form of blocks all the time. Um, so uh, one little trick that I'm going to use in a few places in the code, which obviously most people are familiar with, but if you're new to Ruby, you might want to be aware of it, is uh, I'm going to stop, stop typing out the pipes and the end and all that stuff because uh, there's another version of it where uh, basically that ampersand is called the unary ampersand operator. And basically it's a effectively a function that operates on one thing. So it's kind of like putting a minus sign in front of something or a plus sign in front of something. And this is sort of a bit of syntactic sugar in Ruby that calls a method called toproc on whatever you give it. Um, and so uh, in this case, uh, even with a colon in front of it is a symbol, uh, which in, it's kind of like a string, but it's, uh, you know, there can only, there's only one of them in memory, so even even as a symbol always refers to the same space in memory, whereas if it were a string, it, it, would, refer, it would get its own memory every time. Um, and so basically, the, the short version of it is, that's going to call an even method on every element of my array. So it's doing exactly what the previous one is doing. That's just a little shorthand. So I'm going to kind of bounce between the two of those, but just wanted to call it out. Um, so another pretty basic one that, you know, you're going to do a lot of sort things. Um, so there's a version of sort that sort of behaves the way you think it would in, in most cases. So if you're sorting numbers, it's going to put them in ascending numerical order. Um, if you're sorting strings, it'll put them in alphabetical order. Um, although I think it um, treats lowercase and uppercase differently for strings. Um, but you know, uh, it'll kind of sort the way that you think it would most of the time. Um, there's you can pass a block to sort. Um, and basically, that block, uh, like in a lot of other languages, the sort function takes two things, and you're basically telling it which thing comes before the other one. Um, this is kind of a crazy bit of syntax. I don't actually know why I put that in there, because you know some of you have probably seen it and already know what it does. And if you don't, then I probably don't have time to explain it fully. But uh, it's called the spaceship operator, um, and because uh, it looks kind of like a UFO. So in this case, basically what it's doing is it's saying, should B come before A? And you know, the answer is no for numbers, you know, if they're ascending. Uh, and so it's returning, actually. It took me a second to actually think through what was happening here. Um, but basically, it's saying it should be come before A, no. But then, because I passed the minus A and B to start, it's actually reversing. So that one comes back as 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, a much better way to do this 99% of the time is just to sort it normally and then reverse it when you're done. Um, but I just kind of wanted to throw the spaceship operator in there, because why not? Um, you can also do kind of more complex sorts. It works exactly like the one I just showed with the spaceship operator. I don't even think that's like a semantically meaningful sort. I mean, it's valid code, but I don't know what the hell it would actually produce in reality. So but you can do, as long as at the end of the day it returns negative one, if the first thing should come before the second thing, zero, if, they should, if it doesn't matter, if they're equivalent for your sort. And it should return one if the second thing should come before the first thing. So, 95% um, of the time, probably, I end up using sort by. So, um, sort by, you know, basically, uh, you know, especially if you're working with like Rails objects, you're usually sorting by the name of a record or you know the age of a person or something like that. So, uh, the kind of standard sort function isn't usually as useful as sort by. Um, because you want to call a method or access a field or something. Um, so in this case, again, I'm just kind of throwing syntax at the wall. And if, if you haven't seen the syntax before, feel free to ask about it. But this one basically means uh, produce an array of strings. Um, I'm sure there's some crazy Japanese reason why it's percent %w, but um, <laughs> I assume that. It's a word array. Word array, that makes sense. That's not very Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so basically here, what I'm doing is just sort. So what this is going to do is go through each one of these and call the length method on string. Um, so in this case, it's going to sort the shortest string to the beginning and longest string to the end. Um, and there's that kind of unary uh, ampersand operator I talked about. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting with sort by is you can actually return an array, um, and it'll sort by multiple fields. So if two things have the same name, it will then secondarily sort by age. And that can be sort of end to you know, that can be as many as you want, although I assume at some point it probably gets less performant if you're returning like a 37 array, uh, a 37 element array. Um, one thing with sort by to be careful about is um, it can't compare strings against nil a lot of the time, or it can never compare strings against nil. Um, so if you are returning something that could be nil, you probably want to sort by the two string value of whatever that is. Um, so filtering and grouping, um, first one's pretty simple. Um, I usually end up using detect just because at some point, I feel like I have this um, sort of weird aversion because Rails hijacks fine, and I feel like three years ago, fine was like messed up in Ruby one time, and so I always used detect. But um, but they're, syn they're synonyms. So basically, it returns the first element that matches a particular condition. So uh, find the first odd one, find the first even one, um, or find Waldo, um, and then return. Uh, there's select, which I kind of mentioned earlier. So uh, go through all of the set of numbers from 1 to 10, select the even ones. Uh, if you're a bouncer at a bar, you might want to only select people that are over 21. Um, so that's one example there. Uh, reject is the opposite of select. So select lets anything through that passes the filter. Reject rejects anything that passes the filter. Um, so if you're rejecting the even numbers, it's going to return the odds. If you're Joe uh, and you're pitching a business idea for a single city, uh, you want to keep out the teases. Um, and so you reject them. <laughs> uh, group by. Um, so group by basically splits uh, into things that pass the filter and things that don't. Um, and the keys are going to be the values that come out of it. Um, or, sorry, rather, uh, partitions will does that, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec. But group by will group by what the result of an evaluating condition is. Um, so in this case, you know, if you group by the evens, um, there are those, those ones are false, those ones are true. Um, if you group by people's names, uh, then, you know, uh, or if you group by the first letter of everyone's name, so let's say you're uh, kind of trying to generate a uh, you know, like the iPhone or Android or like a contact list sort of menu, and you want to have letters along the left hand side, you can click on it, it'll take you somewhere. Um, maybe you want to use something like Group By and then iterate through the names that match, use the key to display on the left hand side. Uh, so, partition was the one that I sort of spoiled. Um, so, basically, it'll return you uh, an array of two arrays. Uh, the first thing is everything that passed your filter. And the second one is going to be everything that failed. Um, so in this case, if you partition by even, the first list is going to be even one, the second list is going to be odd ones. One thing that's sort of interesting is because Ruby has sort of destructuring assignment, at least on arrays, um, this is usually where you'll see partition used. Is something like, you know, I want to find the tall people and the short people by partitioning people who are taller than this height or something. And then you might iterate through the tall people. And uh, I, of course, chose a fairly tall height, so I'm sorry, Miles, you're not actually that short. But, uh, so yeah, like, you know, you see this a lot of time again, kind of, it comes up a lot in Rails and things where you might say, um, I want to show two lists, I want to show people that are active members and people that are not, you know, and then so you'll partition and then iterate through each one of those. Um, so kind of the bread and butter, like, you know, map is, I use it all the time. Um, inject and then flat map is newer, but it's pretty useful. I mapped up flatten quite a bit. So, um, so map also uh, alias does collect. Um, I used to type collect and then I got tired of typing it, so now everything's map. Um, so basically, what it'll do is it'll go over a list of things you have and it'll return you a new list that's a function that applies whatever function you give it or whatever block you give it to each element in your list. So in this case, if I go through 1 to 10 and I multiply them all by 3, I'm going to get a list back that's all of the numbers from 1 to 10 multiplied by 3, which is going to be 3 to 30, or in increments of 3. Um, you know, just one example of where this might come up in a web app is let's say you have user records 
and then you want to make a select box or something, right? And the select box needs an ID and a value to show. Um, so maybe I want to kind of go through my list of people, set the ID to be whatever the ID of the user record is, and then set the value of the select box to be their name. Uh, Rails has helpers for that, but um, that kind of pattern comes up quite a bit. So you basically want to kind of go through a list of things you have and transform them into, you know, modify them in some way, and then operate on the transform list most of the time. Um, inject, I was like, oh my gosh, I use inject and reduce all the time. And then I actually looked through code that I've written in the last couple of years, and there wasn't as much of it as I thought there was. So I'm kind of like down on the inject train right now. Um, but it's pretty sweet. So inject basically, it's kind of like math. It goes over each element of your list, and it sort of applies a function. But you're, you're consolidating into a single value at the end. Whereas math, if you give it an array, it's going to return you an array at the same length. Uh, inject, if you give it an array, it's going to return you one thing back. Um, so one really common example is you want to sum a bunch of so you have a list, and you might want to go through and just sum them or multiply them or sum some particular value in each of them. Um, so in this case, uh, you know this is how like this is one way that you can sum. Rails has an actual sum method, but um, the way this works is basically uh, whatever you put in here is going to be the initial value of the first argument in the block. So in this case, zero is going to be sum is going to be zero the first time through. And then whatever the beginning of your, the first element of your array is, is going to be the first thing. So it's going to do 0 plus 1, and then it's actually going to put that back as the value of sum for the next iteration through the loop. So then you're going to get 2, it's going to be 1 plus 2, which is 3, and it's going to keep doing that over and over. Um, there's actually, because patterns like that are so common, and Jack actually has handling for um, not only can you pass it with the ampersand, we can do ampersand colon plus which colon plus is the symbol for plus, which then gets converted into a proc, which means apply the plus method to everything. Um, you can actually leave off the ampersand um, because it's such a common case. So it'll automatically convert the argument to a proc. And when that happens, this kind of unrolls a little bit. Um, and so what it'll actually do is use one as the value the first time through the loop, and use two as the value so it'll use the first two elements basically as sum and n, or whatever those arguments are. Um, so these are actually a couple of you know kind of real use cases where I've used inject. Um, typically, it's like when I'm collecting a bunch of stats off of something, or like I have a collection and I want to find out how many people did something, or um, you know, in this case, I was. Um, and maybe there's a better way to do this. I didn't actually refactor this at all. It was pulled mostly live, so. Um, but like here, I have a list of users, and I want to go through and find out how many of them have a calendar event today so I can send them an email. Um, and so I'm doing some kind of joins, but at the end of the day, what I'm producing is a list that maps email to list of events. So then I have another bit of code that just kind of goes through and processes and says, okay, for everybody in this, send an email to whatever the key is with you know the email template containing their three events for the day. Mm -hmm. um, so inject, I think, is fairly useful for but, you know, the first case there, um, you know, go through each one, store how many times that email address has visited the site or something. So it's really useful for kind of reporting functions. If you write reporting tools, you're probably using Jack a lot more. Um, but yeah, that's typically where I end up using it the most. So flat map, um, again, it's just you know, this is sort of a throwaway a little bit, but. Let's say you're going through the list of residents of Springfield, and you're asking them who their kids are. Um, at the end, and you want to know who are all the kids in Springfield by asking their parents. Um, in this world, you'll kind of get a list of lists. And maybe you want to be able to kind of flatten that out. So normally what you do here is you do the map, you realize, oh, I've got nested lists, and then you call dot flatten on it. Um, there's a slightly more performant way to do that, which is flat map, which was introduced more recently. Um, and that will basically, it does exactly what map does, but it puts them all into a one-dimensional array if they would otherwise be multi-dimensional or uh, multi-nested you know, arrays. So, useful tool to know about. So you said the, the flat map is more just more performant than map.flat? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a teensy bit more expressive as well, especially if you're doing a multi-line block on map. Sometimes you, know, you end up with that dot flattening kind of tucked away at the bottom. Um, and so, if you kind of know that you want, uh, 
If you don't. <laughs> If you know that you kind of want to iterate over a flat array at the end of it, then you know I think flat map was in Ruby two or two one, so it's a little bit newer. I just figured I'd throw it out there in case anybody didn't know about it. Um, so one thing that's sort of good to note is that the enumerable methods don't actually mutate the original array you're operating on. So let's say you store the value of one to ten in an array, and then you uh, you know map over it, multiply them all by three. If you then look at the value of your array at the end, it's still going to be 1 to 10. Um, it won't you know, change it up. So if you do want to use it, you have to store the result. Um, there are methods that will operate on them, like map bang, anything with a bang, basically. There are bang versions of a lot of select and reject. And, um, sort of a great power, great responsibility thing. If you know why you're doing it, feel free to do it. But in general, you probably want to stick to explicitly storing the results if you want them. Um, so again, so, so a couple bonuses. Uh, so lazy is another thing that came in more recently. I think it was 2.1. Um, so let's say you have uh, a list of all the integers from 1 to infinity, and you want to multiply them all by 3 and then take the first 10. Um, that's never going to come back in the first case, uh, because what happens is it goes through every single element from 1 to infinity, multiplies it by 3, and then once it completes that operation, it returns the first 10. Um, that's not super smart in that case. Um, so uh, this is where the neck beards uh, can stroke their beards. Um, Did you look at me? Did I just have it? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, it's a very clean shaven group tonight. But most of we got a few. But, um, so there's a new operator called that lazy. And basically what that does is, in this case, it looks at, oh, I only actually want the first 10. So what I'm going to do is, evaluate this, but one at a time. I'm going to pipe the values through. Um, and so that actually comes back almost instantly. So um, you're probably not operating on the values from 1 to infinity very often, but you might be operating over a data set that's pretty big, and you may only want, you know, I want to know the 10 most expensive SQL queries in my logs or something. Um, you know, you may not need to, or, you know, the, I want to know 10, you know, uh, I guess in my case, you would probably need to go through all of them. But um, you know, there are some cases where maybe you don't need to kind of process all of the elements in the list. Um, so it's a good thing to know about. Um, so I started kind of going down this path, and then I kind of looked at who was on the Meetup page, and I was like, oh, I don't know if this is uh, if I want to go too far down this route. Um, so I tried to keep this a little bit more general. Um, but one pattern that I sometimes use is if I'm using the same sort of uh, block repeatedly. Um, sometimes I'll kind of extract it out into a lambda. Um, I start, I've started doing this more now that I'm doing more JavaScript programming because it's just, oh yeah, functions everywhere. Um, it's not that hard. So, um, so I use the stabby lambda syntax here, but basically this is the same as proc.new or using the word lambda. Um, and basically, so again, uh, you can convert anything to a proc. One thing that's super confusing about Ruby, even at this point, is that block, proc, and lambda are all slightly different, um, but uh, you know. So in this case, basically, I can create. This is sort of a. You can kind of think of it like the function that's going to be applied. It's you know sort of the transformation that will be applied to every one of these elements. But I'm going to store it in a variable so then I can use it later. So basically, for every number that comes in, if it's less than 21, I'm going to reject it. So in this case, go through the numbers from 1 to 30, reject anything, convert the lambda to a proc, because it's not a proc for God knows what reason. Um, and then so that would return 21 through 30 out of that list. Uh, sometimes, somewhat sparingly, but again, if I'm kind of using something over and over and over, I'll actually define a method um, with, uh, you know, and a lot of times that'll have more than one transformation in it. So sometimes I'll do a select and a you know, map and something else, and maybe I'm using that same set of um, of enumerable operators repeatedly. Um, kind of like um, if you've used uh, a thing that I'm trying to give the name of in Rails, um, scope, the name scopes. So if you use scopes and you kind of maybe say, like, okay, active means these three conditions are true, um, you can kind of do the same thing if you use, like, like a method with uh, or if you use kind of chain lambdas and store them somewhere, then you can actually do reject 
set of lambdas. Um, so last one, uh, we're not always in Ruby. Um, so it's good to know about underscore or lodash for those times where you have to slum it in JavaScript. Um, or CoffeeScript, which is slightly less gnarly than JavaScript. Um, for whatever reason, uh, I was about trying to evaluate this slide, and uh, it would not evaluate with the inline CoffeeScript. So I ended up, just for bonus, ended up making it look like the Ruby Lambda syntax. But uh, basically, there's this underscore operator, and these are sort of two alternate syntaxes for the same thing. Um, so the first one's maybe a little bit more kind of classically JavaScripty or functional where um, you can call underscore.map, give it the array, and then give it the function that's going to operate on the array. So in that case, it'll multiply everything by three. Um, or if you're kind of more used to the Ruby syntax, you can call underscore, pass it the array as the argument to underscore, and then call map afterwards. So um, if you are, if you do find yourself in JavaScript, um, you should definitely use those libraries. jQuery does a few, you know, each and four and some of those sorts of operators, but I think, it, I mean, map is coming, or it's in most browsers at this point in the native JavaScript implementation, but um, underscore has basically everything that's in a numerable, even a little bit more in some cases. So I put three exercises together. Um, I'm still okay on time, and I force people to do my work for me. Um, so uh, first one, we'll start kind of simple, but hopefully, but. Uh, Feel free to ask questions, work with a neighbor, or something like that. You don't all have to uh, get to know each other a little bit. So, um, so give it a list of names. Um, return a new list with every name shorter than eight characters reversed and capitalized. So for that list of names there, uh, we want that output at the bottom. Basically, it's basically Ruby Golf. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be. <laughs> It can be. <laughs> Where is it? Scotty Python. He was excellent at that time. So I do this. Yeah. Uh, Scott wrote it well. He was not very amazed. He was an early Just for the kind of camaraderie. Names that select chairs less than eight. Dot map. Uppercase dot reverse. Okay. I know that you also have set days. Uh, for set names. Is that one What? Yeah. Oh, did you need to? Go for it. You know I do. Oh, okay. I can't go. Start with our name, sir. Oh, uh, uh, real fast. Can you do it without uh, uh, doing it interactively? Uh, just get it all over. Uh, you, 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 you don't want to type it in. There's a presentation uh, style file, shipley.com. So this presentation is on. You can copy this. It's very phenomenal. But don't shoot it. Because the next slide will be kind of as my answer. It comes with Ruby. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's generated Ruby. And then Fry is like this, where you can just type in you know, well, different Ruby yeah. functions and get the result back and kind of test things out real quick in the command line. Um, but it has some other functions and stuff built in, so it's just a gem you want to download and use. Uh, uh, and it's like a quarter. But oh, like, so, uh, you start here with this first. Uh, we've got all those in there. Uh, the first thing that we want to do is that we want to do is that we want to for the things that meet your criteria, we're going to isolate the same one that you want, and that will literally just pull them out, basically. Uh, so then we're going to say, okay, let's select, uh, and then we pass it a single amount here. There's nothing. Here, you're not putting it. We've got to put some stuff. Every name that's inside of this names array, 
So you don't think uh, that month would uh, handle the owners too? No. How do you, what's the, what's the keyboard shortcut for the new one? I don't know. You don't know? Um, uh, uh, I think uh, it's a, just like a particular one. Yeah. yeah. Something, uh, something, uh, so like, something like an I'm accent at the E or an E. Right. Yeah. If you hold down the legs, it'll pop up a little. If it's one that has an old soul. I'm trying to get an accent there. Yeah. So try, try, try to do alt. Alt, E, and then you say E. Trying to see if it's just like the next one. There you go. Yeah, so if you hold down, uh, it's called a turn area separator. It's basically just a shorter layout. Okay, so the first one is going to be a uh, Alright, so how would you move on? And then you yeah. put a space and then a question mark. How would you, uh, and then the how would you make the names that charge that length less than eight? How would you make that less? And then when you make less code? Yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know. Uh, probably it's really just size or count, but that's just because I like things that sound more English, I would say, then. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, how, how do you do that? Uh, the alt key? You said the mild bit more than the alt key. Uh, uh, Alright. Or just do... Hmm. Hmm. It's gotta be something else. Maybe it's something more multi byte than that, man. Something less common than like E and N, yeah. To be U. You had a bunch of them. There's a bunch of eyes. It's a bunch of different holes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. No, I can't do that. I want to see the, I want to see the source for the length on the Oh, okay. So, what, what is happening? Because I know this is a problem. I'm not disagreeing. This is a little more, this is a little less code. Just do reverse instead of map reverse. Uh, is, is that how that works? You can. That's fine. Uh, I don't think you can do that. I mean, we can try. Like, just straight up reverse like that? Just array reverse. Okay. Cool. Interesting. All right. Any, anybody want to talk to their solution? Maybe somebody on the newer side a little bit? Let's uh, maybe maybe get, like, you know, we'll kind of see a couple different solutions. But somebody newer to Ruby, you want to present um. talk about how you solved it? Put you on the spot, Rich? Somebody? Just talk about how I solved it? Yeah, sure. Miles, do, do we have a marker? Yes, we do. Kind of whiteboard it, maybe? Yep, I'm going to move. <laughs> All right. Wow. Oh, string encoding get. You can talk. But All right, so I, just, I did start off with an array of names, just my own names, not that one. And then I did a uh, names.map which will iterate through each item and piping n for my local variable of which each name will go into. And then I did an n dot upcase if n dot length greater or shorter than eight. And then of course the end on that because that's the block. And then that return, I discovered that that then returned some nil values if they didn't meet the condition that otherwise it worked. It returned the correct ones uppercase. So then I could store off the that result set into an array called ARR. And then if I did ARR.compact, which Kyle showed me, it strips out the nils magically and left me with only the ones that I wanted. And so with the dot .compact right there on the uh, lock So that's one solution. And basically what happened there was uh, map always returns something. And so in this case, this condition does not evaluate. So the only thing that it can possibly return is null. Like it'll, or it will, the by default, return nil. And so he ended up with nil, nil, and then his two names that were long enough to be capitalized. And obviously we could just drop a dot reverse in there um, and meet the reverse the string condition. But um, so that, that is one way to solve the problem. Um, <laughs> and so maybe somebody else want to talk through how you approached it, how you attacked it? Sure. Um, what we did was uh, similar except for we did uh, select to get all the ones that were less than eight first um, and then did what you call that a urinary? Oh, unary. Unary, uh, unary ampersand on upcase and on the reverse to. Um, okay. To All right. I can just. Uh, so they did basically select and then two maps. So they selected the ones that were too short to meet the, or too long to meet the condition. They mapped upcase and mapped reverse. Um, I know a couple people, oh, sorry, were you going to? Oh, I was just going to say, we were doing that moment and we were trying to figure out the best way to combine it. We just started to think about like, what if we put it into, like, you kind of just put it off into its own defined theory. Sure, you could do, so if reversing and upcasing is a common operation, then maybe it makes sense to split those off somehow. Um, so I think I, a couple people had basically the solution that I had. Um, so I ended up doing the reverse and the upcase in one but uh, basically select the ones that are the right length and then map, you know, reversing up case in the string. So, um, so yeah, reverse and up case are chainable on string. Each, so each one of those returns a string at the end so you can chain them together. Um, so yeah. Real quick, yeah. one assumption is that the way we did it with the two maps is less performant than operating on the both strings at the same time. Do you have any? I would imagine so, but probably not enough to matter 99% of the time. Um, I think in some, in some cases like that, it really kind of comes down to um, 
would, I mean, I generally prefer readability in this case. Um, you know, if reverse, like in this case, reversing and upcasing, they're both operating on a string. They're both kind of fairly similar operations, so I would probably put them in one. But if they were dramatically different, um, like by reversing and then multiplying by three or something, then maybe I would. And you can multiply a string by three, um, but we won't do that. Um, so yeah. So this one, um, and we'll maybe go a little bit quicker because I know Miles wants to make awesome music. Um, so given a list of animals from a crappy data source, let's say it's a CSV that you've read in, uh, figure out how many of each kind there are. So you got some dogs and cats and some fish. And obviously you can count these, but imagine it's a much bigger data set. What's the URL? There you are. Clearly two dogs. <laughs> so the UR, there's a URL at presentations.kyleshipley.com um, if you want to copy that list instead of having to type it in. Um, but the next slide has my answer again. So you want to, if you want to get my gold star, uh, then you'll produce my exact answer. But, you know, actually, I would be more happy if you produce something surprising. So. These are some good names. What's that? These are good names. Yeah. So I was going to have a fish. <laughs> Splashing the knee. This is why I'm not in charge of making your bets at home. <laughs> you are gone one point. So <laughs> 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 Trying to do it all at once, so I want to see uh, what this is going to return. So that gives me a little bit of 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 so now each of these, so I just want to count how many animals. So, so then that gives us, and that gives us that map. Yeah. So yeah, so I have a hash now. So then then you do map. Um, so animals. So on that was the one. KB. Um, uh, KB for KVAD. Okay. KVAD. Okay. Okay. I was going to put a key. I don't know if that's a thing. But you can't do that. You gotta say for some say what hash. Yeah, the name of the I don't I'm so confused about what you're doing here. I mean, just read the questions. Well, I need, I need K to. So I have dog, cat, fish. I mean, I can say V that size. Two one two. So now I just need to get K to be the name and a hash for the name. Probably use tap or something, but that's probably not. In the so I need the name of K. Mm -hmm. 
So I could do something like this. Uh, where I just have an array. But that's not what I need. You're going to take that and turn it into a hat. Um, my, 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 my instinct is to pass two yeah. arguments to group by. And the first thing will be the group. And the second thing will be an array of things in the group. I've never done that before. Yes. So teach me. So group by. Uh, so you're passing two things in here? Is that what you're saying? I can't. And that's probably the first thing my mind goes to, but I don't know. So, sure. So this would be, let's just call this a group name. Oh, sorry. And then this would be values. I don't know what to call that. And then. So, but I don't know that's too much. Ray, group bar. Oh, I only did one. Good. Uh, oh, never mind. That's what we do there. Yeah, this is fairly common though. Just get that. What I do is then I'm grouping it and then I map it out to this and those things, just features. No. So, so this would just be the name of the group, which would be the key. Or just being like, fine, I'll just, so I'll just do this. So the reminder that, that inject can take the initial yeah. parameter yeah. as an argument, and then that yeah. becomes what goes in the pipe there. Mm. So that's, inject is one way that you can jack this problem. So it's probably the simpler way. So. Hmm. Interesting. So if I say. Um, and don't forget to return, if you're building a hash of some sort, don't forget to return your hash at the end. Because that, I still do that quite a bit. I usually have that monkey hashing array and hash with a method called accumulate that does exactly what inject does, but returns its own memo. So. Usually the first argument is either I just, an accumulator I, I or a collector. Them, you just call it A or C usually. <laughs> I about learning a language, just rewrite one and already kind of know. That's, that's the nightmare way. Remember the animal, I suppose. And that'll be an array. So then you can say A, and that, treat it like it's in a hash, and just set the key. Well, that would be He will be what? Uh, animal hot first. Oh, okay. Equals animal dot last. Is that right? I forget what the animals actually look like. It's on your screen. Yeah. So what is in the first? You spelled animal wrong. Yeah. Oh, never mind. It just looks like a weird. <laughs> so, uh, excuse my ignorance here, but I don't know what's in it. Yeah, I think two one. Yeah. 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 Well, I think Charles and Hunter was like, screw my name. Like, they're never going to be right. So, yeah. Here's another thing. You're going to take. So, this is. So, I think I do what's going on here now. I 
Oh, the return, return value. value. Yeah, the return value. Return value. Always looks in its belt. Like, what are these? <laughs> these hey, are it is close. Word it is word. close. Which, which one? Um, which, one? Um, which oh, animal? Oh, I've got it like littered all over my pie. I did that with the word sort. Like when I was writing the sort slides, I used the word. I think it's a word. How do you spell sort? So. 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 Anybody want to start talking through a solution and maybe we can kind of figure it out together? <clears throat> Anybody? Bueller? I've already forgotten what the. Uh... I'll, I'll flip back to the actual screen there. Hmm? Hopefully not flip too far. Okay. So we've got a list of animals. Text-based adventure game yeah. where like <laughs> there are <laughs> dogs, cat, and fish. Would you like to go west? <laughs> you're eaten by a group. Yeah, you were eaten by a group. <laughs> All right, what are you gonna do with the keys once you get them? Um, maybe keys and then uh, collect on that. Yeah, I think you have to put it in parentheses so that it knows these are grouped as a single argument. 
So then in this case, we could use T here instead, or a type. That's what I think I call it. So, little trick. Um, one other thing that I actually forgot you could do, I pretty much always initialize things this way. I forgot that you could actually do hash.new with a zero. That's the first argument to hash. And the first time you access a key, it will automatically initialize it to zero. So instead of an empty hash literal here, if you do hash.new zero, and then you can get rid of that first line there. So that's a, bit, a little bit of golfing, but I, I think it's pretty, I do this a lot. So I saw it and I was like, oh man, I forgot about that. All right, so that's one solution. We can start with inject there. I saw some people playing with group by. You guys get anywhere with group by? Um, we got the type and we got the number, but we didn't get it in the hash syntax. Okay. So basically, you did group by, and what you ended up with basically was you probably have an array with a dog and then a list of. Uh, Oh, sorry, group by, so this is going to be hash, right? Yeah. Um, so dog is going to point to a two on one array with two dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, cat is going to be a one on one array. Um, so once we've done that group, we could actually inject as well and do something very similar to this. Um, I So my first solution uh, was the Mine, I just put on a new line because I ran the space, but basically the one we drew up right there. Um, I did a second solution, which was there's a crazy hash constructor. Um, so <laughs> this is my kind of wacky golfy solution. So uh, I'll explain the asterisk, but animals group by type. Um, so you can kind of do the same thing that we did here. Um, underscore is sort of a convention that means I'm not going to use the value of that variable. We don't care about name here. Um, so I'm grouping by type. Um, and then I'm calling flat map and returning a two element array every time with the type and the number of elements in there. So I actually here, oops, um, instead of returning a hash, I have dog and two as a two element array. Um, and then there is a hash constructor, basically, where if you give it the bracket and then you give it a pairwise set of keys and values to associate. Um, so it basically has to be an even number of things that you pass to it. Um, so like, basically in this case, if you hash open bracket dog2, it'll return a hash with dog assigned to 2, and then if you have cat1, it'll be a hash with cap one as well. Um, so that's one way that you can transform it. And then this asterisk is crazy Ruby magic, uh, which I probably shouldn't describe as crazy Ruby magic, but um, basically it's called a splat operator. And what that does is if there's a function or a method that's um, expecting, it's like if you have an array of five things and the thing that you're calling is expecting a list of n things and not a single array argument, the splat will basically expand this out and pass you know, all of the elements of the array as arguments. Um, so in this case, it's expecting as many pairs of things as you want. So if you splat it out, it'll convert to this form uh, or this form, and then it'll return that. So that's total golfy nonsense. I was just like, there's got to be a way to solve this with group by, and then I kind of got where you guys got. And I was like, well, I'm just going to use inject, and then it'll look like the first solution. And so, um, so this is one case actually where there's a hash constructor enclosure that actually works this way. And so I was like, there's got to be a way to do it in Ruby, right? And it turns out there is. So, so there's one more we can do it or we can not do it because we're getting a little bit late now. It took a little longer than I thought it might. So. How does everybody feel about one more versus shut that off guy out? Let Miles play some blues. All right, thumbs up, one more, thumbs down, get the hell out. <laughs> there are two people who are two up, two down, and one neutral. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, how about. I really like the presentation, though. I'm not trying to. 
Yeah, that's my mission side. That's fine. Yeah. Really yeah. All right, let's throw Miles is up there. I'll leave the last exercise uh, after Miles if you guys want to work through it real quick. Like we can take five, ten minutes and go through it. It's actually from a an actual problem that I had, which was shipping something to Amazon uh, and calculating whether or not something is oversized. So we'll come back to that. Uh, hold that thought. Cool. Is that what? That's it. <laughs>